الليل في حمدان إننا في ليل حمدان نقول نم إذا نام النخيل إننا في ليل حمدان نقول نم إذا نام النخيل عندما تشرق في قرية حمدان النجوم تطفأ الأكواخ والمسجد والبيت القديم إنه النوم جميل تحت همس السعف الشاحب الموت الطويل إنها حمدان سل ونخيل نحن لا نسمع في حمدان إلا ما نقول ليلنا والنخل والحلفاء والنهر القديم حيث أوراق من الليمون في الماء تعوم إنها خضراء كالماء كعينيك إذا شئت أقول أنت يا من يرتجى من لون عينيك الربيع كيف ينساك صديق إنني ألقاك إذ يغمر حمدان الأفول حين يلقى فوقها ليل فقيل وسويا نحن في أعماق بغداد نجول عندما يغمر حمدان الأفول Night in Hamdan. We in Hamdan say, sleep when the date palms sleep. When the stars rise over Hamdan, the lights of the huts are put out, the mosque and the old house. It is the long sleep under the whispers of faded palm fronds, the long death. This is Hamdan, tuberculosis and date palms. In Hamdan, we hear only what we say. Our night, the date palms, Esparto grass and the old river, where lemon leaves on the water drift. They are green like water, like your eyes, I say. You, in whose eyes I behold spring, how can a friend forget you? I will meet you when the setting of the stars covers Hamdan, when <coughs> night bears down on the city. Together we will roam the depths of Baghdad when the setting of the stars covers Hamdan. So, it's exactly seven years ago today since the bomb went off in Mutanabi Street in Baghdad, killing 26 people. Of course, there have been lots of bombs in Iraq, both before and since. But uh, Mutanabi Street, in a way, was something special. It was a street of booksellers a street for ideas and so in a sense the bombing of the street was an attack on ideas as much as on the people in it. Um, I'd like to read you a few paragraphs that were written by Anthony Shadid, the uh, Washington Post reporter. Um, it's quite a long article but the full version is in, in this book. Um, he first visited uh, Motanabi Street in 2003 it was a summer day in 2003 when Iraq was still filled with the half-truths of occupation and liberation before its nihilistic descent into carnage. Mohammed Hayawi, a bald bear of a man, stood in his shop, the Renaissance bookstore. On shelves eight rows high rested books by communist poets and <coughs> martyred clerics, translations of Shakespeare, predictions by Lebanese astrologers, a 44-volume tome by a revered Ayatollah and a tract by the austere medieval thinker Ibn Taymiyyah. Dusty stacks spilled across the cream-coloured tile floor, which was swept but stained with age. In those cramped quarters, Hayawi tried to cool himself with a fan. A car bomb detonated last week on Mutanabi Street leaving a scene that has grown familiar in Baghdad. A collage of chaotic images, disturbing in their brutality, grotesque in their repetition. At least 26 people were killed. Hayawi, the bookseller, was one of them. Mutanabi Street always seemed to tell a story of Iraq. Its maze of bookshops and stationery stores, 
housed in elegant Ottoman architecture, was named after one of the Arab world's greatest poets, a 10th century sage whose haughtiness was matched only by his skill. And of course, Mutanabi uh, came to a violent end as well. Um, he was murdered by somebody who had, he'd insulted in one of his poems. Anyway, Shadid continues, in its heyday, this street embodied a generation old saying, Cairo writes, Beirut publishes, Baghdad reads. But under the UN sanctions that followed Iraq's invasion of Kuwait in 1990, which isolated it from the world, its stores were lined with magazines 20 years old, obsolete textbooks and dust-covered religious tomes that seemed more for show than for sale. It became a dreary flea market for used books, as vendors sold off their private collections in an attempt to get by, and Hayawi and his brothers eked out a living by selling religious texts, works of history for universities and coursework in English, what he called a passport. In the months after the American invasion, Mutanabi Street revived into an intellectual free-for-all. There were titles by Muhammad Bakr al-Sadr, a brilliant theologian killed, as the story goes, when Saddam's executioners drove nails into his forehead. There was Shiite iconography of living ayatollahs and 7th century saints marching to their deaths. Nearby were new issues of FHM and Maxim, their covers adorned with scantily clad women. On rickety stands were compact discs of Osama bin Laden's messages selling for the equivalent of 50 cents. Down the street were pamphlets of the Venerable Communist Party. As one of the booksellers once said, quoting a line of poetry by Mutanabi, with so much noise, you need ten fingers to plug your ears. When the Mongols sacked Baghdad in 1258, it was said that the Tigris River ran red one day and black another. The red came from the blood of nameless victims massacred by ferocious horsemen. The black came from the ink of countless books from libraries and universities. Last Monday, the bomb on Mutanabi Street detonated at 11.40 a.m. The pavement was smeared with blood. Fires that ensued sent up columns of dark smoke fed by the plethora of paper. So that's the street. Rasan, you have experience of being a real Arab bookseller. Would you like to tell us about it? Uh, well, that was when, in my childhood. When go I used on. to go to my father's bookshop in Tripoli, Libya. Uh, my father started uh, his uh, bookshop in, in the 1950s, uh, where he started with a small collection of books. He was one of the first booksellers in Tripoli, among a couple of others. Um, and he grew his business. Uh, in, in, by 1978, we had uh, three bookshops there, uh, two of them Arabic and uh, one English language bookshop. And I spent my childhood in these bookshops and in our warehouses for the books. Uh, my father eventually became a distributor. We brought books, imported books from Lebanon and Egypt. Uh, but in 1978, uh, that all ended when Gaddafi decided uh, that the government would take over importing of books and nobody could own their own business. So they closed my father's shops down and took all the inventory. Uh, my father moved to London in 1979, fearing for his life and for the lack of work for him. And here we started a new business of a publishing company and we opened a couple of bookshops that operate in London. Um, You've reopened in Libya now? Yeah, uh, back then when Gaddafi started opening up the country a little bit, my father decided to go back because that's his backbone there. And uh, started with another bookshop and he bought all the books that he published and all his inventory, he had to buy them back from the government <laughs> to open a new bookshop. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then, uh, and now we are back to another three bookshops in London run by the family, my brothers and sisters. And we started the, the publishing business again. I think our first 20 books were all about the Libya revolution, different aspects from people who lived it. Uh, and. And here in London, we are starting the publishing adventure again with 
uh, doing translated literature from Arabic countries. Thank you, Margaret. Well, I'm very happy to be here today on this uh, sort of pan-Arab uh, UK commemoration of uh, the bombing of uh, Walton Levy Street. Uh, it was really nice to have a Libyan bookseller next to me and a, I think, Syrian poet, Syrian actor and the Iraqi actors reading poems and, you know, Barbara and I, uh, we are just publishing, uh, publishing Arab authors. Um, so we were thought, what, what is the what, way you can preserve literary heritage? This is the subject that we're discussing today. We, we really, you have to build on it. You have to preserve it in a live way to carry it on for the next generations. And it's here, we're actually bringing many strands together, the book selling world, readers, publishers, and um, performers to commemorate this uh, terrible destruction in Milton Abbey Street, which was really an attempt to silence the free vo voice of literature and of books. Um, when we started Bunny Pal magazine back in 1998, one of the reasons we gave then was uh, it was for the pure joy and excitement of reading beautiful poetry and imaginative writing. And we've also always thought that literature reflects the heart and soul of a country's culture as the ideas and dreams. And uh, even last year in the annual lecture of the Reading Agency, uh, the guy called Neil Gainham, Gainham, who was a very internationally renowned author, he was talking about the importance of encouraging the act of reading, building empathy, and having the freedom to read, and the freedom of ideas gives you freedom of communication. So one of the reasons I'm telling you this is, is that a few years ago, we actually started the little library around the corner for Arabic literature in English translation. I should say Arab literature, because it's literature not only written in Arabic, but some Arab authors, very well-known Arab authors, write in French, some of them in German or Dutch, and some of them even in English. So we, are, we started the library a few years ago, and we started it um, when the London Book Fair had a, um, they had the Arab publishers as their market focus in 2008, and uh, Banipal worked with them to pr have a display at, during the book fair showing what Arab works in the literature had been translated into English. And then we, we said, well, we, we have to do something with the books. So we, we founded the library with, with the books that were on display there. So we've got a database of books which has about um, 1,100 odd works on it. But up to now in the library, according to my figures, we, we have about 620. And we're always looking for ways to, uh, to increase the, the number of books. Um, and uh, one day we'll have another discussion on that. And uh, Arab authors probably around a thousand authors over the 16 and a bit years that we've been publishing. Excerpts, short stories, poems, main, mainly of course from Arabic. And in that course of that time, we've published over 110 Iraqi authors and about 15 Libyan authors, over 40 Syrian authors, 50 to 60 Palestinian authors, it goes on. I mean, all over the Arab world, there is an incredible richness of literature. And we were talking upstairs about um, the sort of styles and the way in which the Arab authors, because in, with the novel and fiction, there's, there's not a huge tradition, a long tradition as there is in the West of the, of the novel. So you actually get a very big variety of styles and even subject matter. And one of the things that some mainstream publishers 
in the West find it really difficult to get to grips with, so they end up not publishing, is that today's authors from the Arab world confound every single stereotype that exists in the West. And so they get a book coming, perhaps a book that's winning one of the prizes uh, that there are, and this author is not, does not go along with the stereotypes that they think that Arab authors should be writing about. So they don't want to publish it because here is an author, you know, maybe writing something that is cutting edge, very, very modern, uh, could be published, could have been, come from any country anywhere in the world. Um, but because it doesn't con confirm <coughs> the stereotypes of, that they exist still in the West, they, they don't like to publish it. Um, my speech today, because, um, uh, I mean, I have declared my undiluted love to, to Banipal and, and what Margaret and, and Sam are doing many, many times. So today, my declaration of love is to the booksellers. Um, it is, uh, we need them, all of us here today, need the booksellers, uh, but especially we the publishers do, um, because as a publisher who started his career as a bookseller used to always say, a book is only published when it's sold. My fascination with Arabic fiction started when that bookseller turned publisher thrust a translation of Miramar by Nagib Mafous into my hands when we boarded a train from Cairo to Alexandria a little over 10 years ago. That's why I'm saying I'm an upstart here. Um, uh, it was an easy, if untypical, introduction to the writing of the first Nobel Prize laureate for literature from the Arab world. Next, uh, this particular bookseller turned publisher called Mark Lintz gave me Children of the Alley, and I was hooked. This sweeping history in which mankind follow and is saved by one prophet after another, only to forget his teachings when he's gone, told me a lot about a brave author and his visionary publisher. As the founder of Continuum, Werner, as he was known in New York, had published many important books on the world's religions and philosophies and recognized in Mafuz not only a great author, but also a great thinker, brave enough to write about politics and religion in a region where that can get you killed, which it almost did in the case of Children of the Alley. Mafuz repaid the compliment by create, um, crediting Mark as he was known when he became director of the American University in Cairo Press with helping him to win the Nobel Prize. If it had not been for the AEC Press's translation of his works into English, Mafuz always said that the judges would never have been able to appreciate his writing. He was therefore thrilled and enthusiastically supported Mark's plan for a Nagib Mahfouz Medal for Literature, an annual prize that saw the winning work translated into English and published by the AUC Press. In November 2012, I arranged a meeting between Sidi Hassan bin Talal and Mark at the bookhouse, my little bookshop, <laughs> in London to discuss a 10-year project of dialogues and publishing of, yes, a hundred books <laughs> in 10 categories ranging from religion to philosophy and literature and arts to preserve and promote the genius of Arab civilization. Great minds, it is said, think alike. And what emerged from that meeting was a synthesis of the views underlying Sidi Hassan's pioneering WANA forum and Mark's original plan for an annual conference and papers, as well as plans to publish the most distinguished scholars from the West Asian and North African region. 
by broadening the geographic sphere, these two men made sure the endeavor they conceived that day would be different from other publishing projects and avoid privileging one particular core national, ethnic, religious, or linguistic group. <laughs> Instead, it would concentrate on shared values and concerns and include works from Turkey, Iran, as well as all the stars. Following Mark's sudden death um, on the 9th of February 2013, I have decided to go ahead with the project and to publish the books in Mark's memory. I hope to continue his work building bridges across cultures, religious and language divides, both between but also within the Orient and Occident, and thereby build a lasting memory for the great publisher he was. Nagib Mahfouz once said, true death is forgetfulness, and that is why days like this are so important. As long as we remember the booksellers of Al B Street, they will not truly die. As long as we continue to hear Muhammad's, you've quoted him before, Muhammad's words, he said, I challenge anyone to say what has happened, what's happening now, and what will happen in the future. As long as we can still hear Muhammad's words, then he will not have died on Al Mutamadi Street on that fateful day seven days seven years ago. Never forget this particular bookseller's challenge and long live booksellers all over the world. <laughs> Great. Would you like to tell us? Um, I have been there two thousand ten. After it it's been renovated, reconstructed, reconstructed, renovated, and this, uh, mm -hmm. the cafeteria, the Shabander, sh was there. His sons died, but the man standing tall there, he, he put the pictures, the photos of his sons on the wall. Um, four died for him, and died in the same um, accident. And uh, life is back. I saw it lightly. When I went there, it was lightly. And I bought a few books also. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there were books, uh, as you said, about everything, even about Saddam, even about uh, you can Castle, see, yeah. Mary, I mean, uh, it was both uh, anything, really anything. Range of things. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's funny range. Yeah. Everything. And you've been in those books? My first visit to Mutanabbi Street was in 1950, when I was five, five years old. <laughs> My father used to have an office, he was a lawyer, on the first floor of one of the buildings which still exists today. And he was there for about 15 years. Most of the inhabitants of those streets, of the, in those times, were lawyers. And they happened to have the best private libraries in their homes. I grew up in a home where we had books everywhere, either, even in the bathroom. My uncle was there for 40 years, and when he died, unfortunately, his wife sold his library to one of the booksellers in Mutanabi Street, who was under the building. I think it's somewhere on the, on the right-hand side of this. It's an old building. I can see it from here. Anyway, this is my story with Mutanabi. I was there on a research trip, and I, wanted, I was desperate to go to Mutanabi Street, so... I went, and um, it's exactly like the photos. Very busy, loads of books on the floor, and um, yeah, it's great. Great. And um, my dad bought some books as well. <laughs> I've not been to Mutanami Street, but I, I was serving in the British Army in Basra at the time of that bombing, um, and I wrote a, a, a war diary while I was in Iraq. And it, was, it was the first book that I wrote, which um, I've just written. A, there's a book coming out this year, I've written. But it was the first book I wrote when it was a handwritten book. And weirdly enough, when I started looking at literature, the first story ever told is um, the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is just from just south of Basra. Yeah. Um, and I've just been reading about how 
the Muslim uh, philosophers brought Greek philosophy to uh, the, when the Romans lost uh, Greek, uh, and they actually translated it with paper from China in Baghdad. So they've uh, got a smart connection to this. Laklaku Naysan. Hakada ja bila tablin wala firkati musika. Ataha hadi an munhamikan. في اللحظة الأولى اختيار الداء في الثانية العود الذي سوف يكون العش في الثالثة العش ولكن المدينة لم تزل في القاع لم تعرف لماذا جاء لن تعرف ما يفعل لن تدري به حين يناديه الرحيل April Stork He arrived like this without drums or marching band he arrived tired and quiet. The first decision, choosing a house. The second, the straw that will make the nest. The third, the nest. But the city is still in ruins. It does not know why he came. Will not know what he will do. Will not notice him when departure calls on him. <laughs> يمرون بي عابرين سوف أذكرهم والذين يجيئونني مثقلين سوف أنساهم هكذا حين تندلع الريح بين الجبال نصف الريح دوما وننسى الحجر Attention Those who come by passing I will remember them and those who come heavy and overbearing, I will forget. This is why when air gushes between mountains, we describe the wind and forget the rocks. Ya bilad al-lati lastu fiha, ya bilad al-baida, hina tabki al-sama, haythu tabki al-nisa'u, haythu la yaqra'u al-nasu illa jarida. يا بلاد التي لست فيها يا بلاد الوحيدة أيها الرمل والنخل والجدول أيها الجرح والسنبل يا عذاب الليالي المديدة يا بلاد التي لست فيها يا بلاد طريدة ليس لي منك إلا شراع المسافر راية مزقتها الخناجر والنجوم الشريدة Solos on the Oud. Land where I no longer live. Distant land where the sky weeps, where the women weep, where people only read the newspaper. Country where I no longer live. Lonely country, sand, date palms and brook. O oh, wound and spike of wheat, O oh, anguish of long nights. Country where I no longer live my outcast country. From you I only gained a traveller's sails, a banner ripped by daggers and fugitive stars. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Hassan, you, you are unique in, I mean, you're an Arab bookseller in an Arab country and also in London. And I think Queen's Park Books is one of your bookshops, isn't it? Yes. yes. I mean, there was a, a top five West London independent bookshops poll in our local magazine. And it was there, you know. I mean, how how you think you emphasise the community, don't you? Could you just say something about your experience of? Well, Queens Park is unique. It's uh, the area itself. It's like a village, you know. Even the the parade where we're on, maybe have twenty shops total, and there's a small post office. So our bookshop has become a destination in the area. When people go out, they come there. We have uh, our staff managers and everybody worked there very helpful very knowledgeable uh, our bookshops now we depend on children's books as well as the backbone of the shops we, our sales about 30 percent children's books and uh, parents come there and buy birthdays holidays everything they always buy books for as presents um, and everybody there is very supportive 
and you will get people come in and say, I saw this on Amazon, but I want you to stay in the neighborhood. So that's why we come to buy from you. We also make connections with the schools in both of the bookshops. For example, this year with the World Book Day in March, uh, the, between the two bookshops, we'll probably be giving away 3,000 free books. The scheme that's done by the book tokens and the publishers. Uh, we invite schools to come in. We go take school, take books to schools as well. And I think the most important thing is is the staff we have. It's, uh, as I say, it's very knowledgeable, very friendly, and we never say we don't have a book. We always try to find it. Uh, sometimes, <coughs> if I don't have it in my bookshop, I'll go in my car mm. and go to a bookshop that I know has and get it for mm. my customer. Barbara, could you tell us about your bookshop? Yes, that bookshop. Yeah, go on. Um, <coughs> uh, it, came out, no, it came about uh, almost by mistake. Um, I, I started my publishing house uh, um, about 11 years ago. Um, and uh, at first, like so many startup companies, I ran it from my upstairs room. And eventually, uh, I wanted my life back, or so I thought. Um, if if I move it out of my flat, then I I would have a, um, a, a private life. But I had also started the business with my now, and she will forgive me um, uh, for mentioning her age my now 85-year-old mother. Uh, so I couldn't impose on mother who wanted to continue to be part of the, the business and the publishing um, uh, a daily commute on the London Underground. So I looked around um, uh, the area for a, a, a small premises where we could uh, run the publishing house and found a house, and we are called House Publishing, so I thought, like you named it Dar, so I mean, this was my Dar, and I found it. Um, and uh, I, I um, got the lease, but uh, my landlord was very particular that um, this had been a shop for 200 years, and it was going to continue to be a shop. Um, so I said, well, the obvious combination between a publishing house and a shop is a bookshop. And I have <laughs> uh, not really regretted that decision ever since because it is, in a way, we were talking about that before, um, this is a, a very traditional way of combining publishing um, and, and book selling. Uh, once upon a time, my illustrious predecessors as publishers in this in this town, people like Andre Deutsch, they always had a bookshop in the uh, in the uh, on the ground floor of their publishing house. So I'm continuing that tradition, um, and it is a tradition which is very familiar in the Middle East, uh, where uh, publishers are booksellers, printers, uh, and all of the above. Um, uh, so it's it's a it's a wonderful tradition, and in the times when uh, we, um, as publishers and booksellers, have to face um, considerable challenges, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it is actually a, a wonderful way to actually um, engage with the the um, uh, your. Um, most important people, namely you readers. Um, uh, I, um, we take turns um, to sit in the shop and and to um, uh, actually engage with the people who come in and say, well, what would you recommend? Well, I know what I would recommend because I published it. <laughs> so, I, mean, I, I, I can actually engage with somebody and, and I will also have to take the criticism, the immediate criticism. <laughs> so, is, is it actually getting easier to publish books these days? Because if you think back in the past, you know, the metal type that had to be composed by hand and that sort of thing. Now a writer can produce a word file and there are even shops where you can have a book printed yes. on demand. Absolutely. So, it, you know, you don't need to print thousands of copies to justify the typesetting costs and things. Um, yes and no. <laughs> well, do you want um, to kind of elaborate? Um, do you want to 
you jump in there or do, shall I? Um, I'll have both of you if you like. Well, um, I, I think, uh, yes, it is easier for um, uh, a, an author to, uh, to um, publish their writings. Um, and if you know your market um, very well, then I would encourage you to do, uh, do so. Um, uh, however, uh, uh, the, it, it is uh, not just writing and printing a book, it is actually, that's why my, my great um, uh, uh, love affair with the booksellers, you have to sell it um, and therefore you have to market it. And, um, and marketing and selling um, is something <laughs> which uh, uh, an author uh, uh, can do and can be very helpful if he's, he or she is involved in, in that. Um, but that's the, where we come in as publishers, where we sort of add value, so to speak, to the, pro uh, to the project. We can also help in terms of um, uh, editing, uh, because, I mean, sometimes... It's good to have somebody else read it before yes. it sets <laughs> its <streets. laughs> um, And I, I, I tend to agree with you. To publish a book is not just to write it and print it, and, and you, could, you could write the best book in the world, but if you don't market it and distribute it right, you don't do it justice. And sometimes you have to continue with publishing the book and support it for a long time, and that, that can be costly, especially translation books, you know, the, the expense there. Uh, and you are competing with so many books around, especially here in the United Kingdom, uh, what do you say, how many, 100,000 books per Yeah, year? more than 100,000. I think there's, a, there's quite a big difference now, in a <coughs> funny way, between the publishing world in, in the West, or here, and and in, in the Arab world. In the Arab world, people are... Uh, generally, authors have found it very easy to publish because they just hand some money over to the publisher or the printer, and they print so many, a couple of thousand or a thousand, and give them so many, and, and they're away. But there's no marketing, really. There's, there's, they take the books to book fairs and, and sell them to booksellers there. Uh, and there's now more and more authors wanting some a bit of copy editing done, some editing on the book so that it's a really good product in Arabic. Whereas here, there is more and more self-publishing going on. Whereas, you know, people always look down on what's called vanity publishing or self-publishing because you wanted to get a good publisher to publish your book and then market it. But that seems to be going out mm -hmm. of the window, in mm -hmm. a way. Um, um, but you can write your own book and put it on Amazon and sell can, it on Kindles. Yeah, and, and you're growing and there are conferences <coughs> about this. Mm. And the other thing that I've been thinking about recently is that in, here, in, uh, you know, you look in the magazines, there's Faber Academy, there's this academy. There's so many different ways in which you, you can actually learn to be a writer. Or you can go on creative writing courses. Every single university has creative writing courses. I don't think that really exists in the Arab world, and yet there's a fantastic upsurge in writers. The number of young people and uh, all, all different generations actually writing, writing novels and writing how, poetry. How many people in the Middle East make their living from writing books, do you think? Um, well, I only know Ibrahim Nasrallah is a Jordanian author. He writes full time now. He doesn't do any other work. That's very but rare, isn't it? Very rare. Most authors are, you know, journalists. Have other or jobs. Yeah. They've got other jobs. Even Nagib Mahfouz gets his exactly. Job and, um, as a cleric. Yeah. Allah Aswani, I think, still a pulls a few teeth out yes, from time to yes, time. Yes, he does. <laughs> yes, is worrying. And, uh, yes, I mean, so he, he's also a Sudanese author. He's he's a, a dentist. Uh, I mean, can I jump in there? Um, uh, because <coughs> this is something which we are uh, uh, facing when we're, we're working with with uh, Middle Eastern authors. Uh, because there is such a difference in the tradition of publishing, uh, where uh, mm -hmm. your publisher was basically your printer and you paid him, um, uh, uh, the, the idea of an author's contract 
is uh, something which isn't really very well known. And this has led to quite a few conflicts because um, therefore the, the, these, these contracts, these author contracts are basically authors licensing the publishers to publish the book. Um, but in, in the Middle East, it's, it's a contract where you hand over money and, uh, as, as the author and get um, her printed books in return. You pay which, the publisher. Yes. Which is and what we call vanity indeed. publishing here. Um, but now when we as, as, as Western publishers then try to ascertain who owns the rights in this, these uh, books, when we want to translate them, in other words, um, we, where do we go? To the publisher or to the author? Who, owns, who still owns the right? Is that contract between the Middle East and publisher um, and the author, does that include translation rights as it does in a, in a license agreement between a, a Western author and a m m publisher? This is something which is, is creating quite a few nightmares for us, but I mean, um, it, it needs a bit of a learning <coughs> process on both sides, uh, what is an author contract. So I'm always hoping that, that uh, these academies that are now, Margaret is absolutely right, springing up all over the place, they should do also a course in contracts, mm -hmm. <laughs> author contracts, in, in actual, pr the, the process of publishing, um, um, uh, that it, it's, uh, both sides need to understand the basics um, when they, they embark on this great adventure called publishing a book. I think it's kind of changing in the Middle East now, because all the, I'm contracted with about three writers now, mm -hmm. and they all have contracts. Did they pay you or did you pay them? No, no, I paid them. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to do it the right way. Yes, yeah. And uh, some of them have agents now. They, they yeah, they're they're agents. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So, it's, just, yeah. so it's, it's good good for them, you know. They, they have to protect yeah. themselves. They already, I think they've already been abused yeah. in the market there. I know of an author, I talked to him, asked him about his book. He said, I don't know, I just sent the manuscript to its publishing company and then the book was out. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> yeah. Did they edit it? He said, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I mean, the book, my first, my first book um, uh, that I wrote, I handed over every right in the book. <laughs> might exploit it, mm. might not, uh, might exploit you. <laughs> Going back to bookselling, I was wondering before we started this discussion whether there are any comparable streets to Mutton Nabi Street anywhere else in the Middle East. Does anybody... In Cairo, Sur al-Azbakiya. Uh, Azbakiya is a public garden uh, park. Ah, that's right, And yeah. around it there is a <laughs> Little school, book a, a fence. And they, they used to hang... And then um, in the year 2000, the government yeah. built fuel chaos to sell. Uh, one day we went looking for... My husband was looking for a book, English Kurdish. I think in that market... Uh, Dar Shuruk, which is one of the biggest Egyptian, their father started there from, from that market. Mm -hmm. and now he's one of the biggest uh, publishing mm -hmm. companies in Egypt, maybe Arab world. And he's the head of the Arab Publishers Association, even while. 